Well, good morning, and welcome to Church of the Rockies. We're so glad that you're here to worship. I'm rubbing some lotion in my hands really quick so I can flip the pages because they're dry. That's terrible, but honest. All right. Well, since I've been a slacker and not here the last three weeks, we're going to do live music today. That'll be super fun. All right. If everybody wants to stand, we'll get going. everybody. How y'all doing? Good. Uh, welcome to Church of the Rockies, and for those that are at home, uh, welcome online. And if you are sick, I hope you feel better soon. If you are visiting us today, we have this lovely coffee mug, and uh, that's just for you to take, and when you are drinking out of it, be praying for us and thinking of us. Uh, we also have a Connect card, Um, and with that, we have a few announcements. Our Lottie Moon Christmas offering is still going. Is this our last? Okay, last week was the last week. However, we are very, very close to our 5,000. And if you would like to donate today, we will still take that from you. It goes straight to those serving in and around the world. Um, we also have a student ministry slash youth group uh, activity today. If you need more information, please see Justin, and he can help you get the information you need. 
the leadership and admin team for January is January 15th. If you are a part of that program or uh, team, then um, mark your calendars, don't forget. And lastly, our fourth quarter ministry rally will be on January 29th. We are going to have hot dogs and buns, but if you can bring a side like a salad or a cornbread or dessert, that would be great. Or if you would like to bring chili, there will be a chili cook-off. Okay, so if you think you have the best chili in the church, bring it. There's a prize? There's a prize. So now you really want to make some chili and bring <coughs> some. All right. Please let us know what you will bring, you'll be bringing. A sign-up sheet is on the table at the top of the stairs so that we know what we need to fill in. Um, with that, I think we're going to go on to prayer. All right. All right. So one more announcement related to prayer. Um, we, uh, Lainey and I have been talking, Lainey is our prayer organizer, leader, and we've been talking about, uh, about prayer. And we came to a conclusion that praying together is the normal way of operation for the church. If you read the book of Acts, the very first things you see the, you see the church doing is praying together. Um, so we think that is extremely important and extremely valuable, that that is the way, the vehicle through which God works in his church. Um, so we want to be a lot more intentional about corporate prayer or for us praying together. So to that end, immediately following the service, we're going to have a meeting for those of you who are interested in participating in corporate prayer ministry, uh, whether that's a prayer meeting or we're, we haven't figured out exactly what that's going to look like. That's what this meeting is going to be is how is that going to work best for us? Those of you who are dedicated to prayer, who want to have that time of prayer together, um, that more than just in a Sunday morning service, um, stick around after the service and we'll have a quick meeting together and kind of figure out the best way uh, for us to do that, um, what works best for us all together. So stick around for that, and also we'll have a special assignment for you prayer warriors to stick around for that too. Um, so that being, be, being the case, I did want to spend focus this morning's time prayer not just on preparing our hearts for the worship service, but also we have a lot of people who are sick today. Um, uh, I know JR's dad was in the ER this week. Um, Scott and Shelly are out sick. Uh, Lori's sick, so her, her, her and Ron are not here. Mike Jens is sick. We've got a lot of people that are not doing well. And so there, I'm sure there are others. So as we pray this morning, pray in your heart for someone you know is, is, is not doing well, is not feeling well. And uh, we're going to pray together for those. For those. I'm, sure there's, I'm sure there's more. There's, there's a lot of empty seats here today, so I'm sure that this upper respiratory junk is just taking its toll in the area here. So... Um, so let's be praying for those that are not doing well and pray that the Lord will, will uh, use this service to his glory. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and uh, you can pray in your own and then we'll pray together. Father, you are good. You are gracious. Lord, you deserve all glory. This morning as we come together to worship, I pray, Lord, that that would be our heartbeat today. To seek to give you glory in all that we do. Lord, because you are the only one who is worthy. I pray as we sing, we would sing as unto you not as unto our neighbor, not as unto impressing those around us, Lord, but that we would sing for your, for your 
for your glory with you as our audience. May we participate together in worship in that way. Lord, as we hear your word preached, again, Lord, I pray that you would be glorified in it, that your word would be spoken, that your word would shine through and shine bright. And Holy Spirit, that you would even begin now working in our hearts and speaking to us about what you may, what your word may be convicting us of or encouraging us, Lord, as the case may be. Lord, I pray for those who are sick. Lord, your word tells us we have an obligation as a community of faith to pray for one another, to bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Lord, to lay hands on and pour oil on those who are sick and pray for them. Lord, we don't have any oil this morning. The people who are sick are not here But Lord, we do pray for each of them. Lord, I pray for Scott and Shelly. You'd help them to get back to 100%. Lord, I pray for, for Mike and for Lori. Lord, you'd help them to, to heal. Lord, you are the great physician. You don't need doctors. But Lord, in your sovereignty, you do give us doctors. Lord, whatever the case is, whatever the illnesses are, whatever the needs are, Lord, I pray that ultimately you would be the one to give comfort and protection. Lord, you would bring healing. You would bring, uh, Lord, you you would have your will in those situations. Lord, not just so we can have comfort, though, but so that we can be at our best to to serve you to your honor and glory. Lord, I pray for others. I pray for. Lord, I pray for Jr.'s dad. Thank you for the quick healing that he has had so far. Lord, as he continues to recover from the operation he had earlier this week, Lord, I pray that you would, you would be glorified in that. You'd help him know that he is loved and he is cared for. <clears throat> Lord, I pray for others who might be sick or are struggling. Lord, I pray that you would, you would put your arms around them, that you would help them to know that there's a church that loves them and cares for them too. Lord, there are others who may be struggling and not because of physical ailments, Lord, but because of emotional ailments. Lord, I know that uh, uh, Nathan is, he had recently had a friend that died I pray for that family. I pray for Nathan that in this time of grieving. Lord, uh, Jolene, who's been with us, her, her nephew's funeral was yesterday, so I know the grief is still near for her and for her family. Lord, I pray for her that you would help comfort her. Lord God, I pray this morning that you would be honored and glorified by our worship. Praise in your name. Amen. If you'd like to stand, we'll sing our next song.
just thank you so much for the fact that you are a living hope. You are the reason why the world turns. Um, Lord, I just thank you for your hand of healing um, for my family personally this week. Um, I thank you for your goodness when we don't even ask. Um, and Lord, I just thank you for how faithful you are at all times. Lord, I just pray that uh, you're with Justin this morning as he delivers the sermon to us, the words that you would have us to hear. Lord, I ask that they pierce our hearts. Lord, I just pray that all moments, whether small or big, when you provide them, Lord, that our eyes are open and we don't miss them. I ask this in Jesus' name, amen. I did have two other uh, prayer requests that I had forgotten to. Uh, I just it drew a blank on me. Um, Hans has pneumonia this week, so be praying for Hans as well. And um, as you well know, Josh Guasp had his surgery earlier this week on his neck. Um, and uh, so continue praying for Josh's healing as well. In fact, let's go to the Lord this morning and pray for those two more, those two more health needs and health concerns, and then we'll dive into the text. Father, I uh, come to you again, Lord. I, I, I apologize again for my feeble mind that I uh, forgot these two requests. Lord, we do pray for Josh and Hans, that, Lord, you would bring healing. Uh, we know you can. We know you are able. Lord, we want your will to be done in their lives. I pray that you would um, help them recover quickly, Lord, and that they would turn to you and put their faith and trust in you in this situation, Lord. In your name, amen. Uh, so last week, I did get a chance to announce to everybody and let everyone know that my wife and I are expecting our fourth child. So if you missed that last week, you know now. Um, so those of you who've been praying for her, uh, she is, again, she has pretty severe morning sickness, kind of all day, every day thing. Um, this is not abnormal either. Uh, this has been kind of for all four, all three of the kids so far. Um, and in fact, in some ways, it's been better than other. Anyway, so it's still bad. <laughs> but um, so keep praying for our family as we try to uh, do with one down for the most part. So, um, so thank you for your prayers on that. Uh, if you're here, I see lots of visiting faces today. So if you're here visiting with us, again, welcome. And we're so glad you're here. You're not, we're not only glad you're here, but we want you here. So we're thankful for your presence here with us this morning. Uh, we're diving back into the book of Revelation. This is our final stretch. No more breaks. We're going, we're going to finish the book out. We've got about seven more weeks left of the book of Revelation. We're going to be in Revelation chapter 17. Revelation chapter 17. This morning we're not going to read the whole chapter to start off, but we are going to read vo verse 14. Um, and uh, I think verse 14 kind of is the centerpiece of the entire chapter, uh, the climax of the chapter, the top of the action. Verse 14 says this in Revelation chapter 17. They will make war on the Lamb, and the Lamb will conquer them. For he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those with him are called and chosen and faithful. Let's ask the Lord to bless to bless his word this morning. Lord, I pray as we walk through this chapter, Lord, we will get to the heart of the matter. We will get to the heart of why Revelation 17 exists in our Bibles. Lord, why you have it here for us. Lord, its purpose is. And Lord, why it's here before us this morning. I pray, Lord, that through your Holy Spirit, you would already begin working. And you continue to help us, Lord, we'll look, search our hearts, seek for any areas of our hearts where there is a lack of faithfulness, and Lord, uproot it and turn our attention to you. Lord, if there is someone here who does not know you as Savior, I pray that this would be a message that would drive them to you, drive them to know you, the one who can bring them salvation. Praise in your name. Amen. Babylon is finally exposed in this chapter. We've had Babylon mentioned two times before this book of Revelation. In chapter 14 and verse 8, she is declared to be fallen. She's already a defeated enemy. She had made all the nations drink the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality, 14 verse 8 tells us. And in 1619, 
She is made to drink the cup of the wine of the fury of the wrath of God. So where she is feeding the nations the cup of her abominations, God will make her drink his wrath. Now in chapters 17, 1 through 19, 10, we see both of those scenes in, in chapters uh, 14 and 16 played out in full detail. As the bowls of God's wrath are poured out, which we saw in chapter 16, and we anticipate the final consummation of all of history, we pause for the next couple chapters to see the final demise of the great city, the Antichrist, the false prophet, and the dragon. In chapters 12 and 13, the dragon, the beast, the false prophet were all introduced in all of their disgusting gore, leading the readers of the book to ask the question, whose team am I on? And now one final plea is given in chapter 17 as the woman Babylon is described for us. Since it's been a few weeks since we've been in the book, let's reach back for some more context from the rest of the book. All the way back to chapter 1, we are introduced to John, who is given a vision on the Isle of Patmos. He is a prisoner on this island. He sees the triune God who is and who was and who is to come. He sees the Lamb who is the first and the last, who died and has came to life before a glorious scene uh, of, a tr of triune worship, we are also introduced to seven late first century churches. While none of them are perfect churches, some are praised more than others. But what Jesus finds valuable about those churches, it's not their size, it's not their budgets, it's not their locations. What he finds valuable about those churches is their faithfulness to him. Despite the allure of the surrounding anti-Christian culture and despite heavy persecution. The churches, in fact, that Jesus finds to be most despicable are those who had buckled under the pressure or had acquiesced to the surrounding ungodly culture, self-satisfied in the wealth and stability that their tolerance and acceptance had brought them. So the rest of the book drives us toward the end of history, showing how the decision to follow an anti-Christian world system is a fool's errand. The call to the Christian, then, is faithfulness to Christ. The call to the unbeliever is to get on the winning team by, surrounding, by surrendering excuse me, and worshiping the Lamb with the rest of the host of heaven. Chapter 17 is meant to open our eyes to what's really behind the curtain. Like the Wizard of Oz where the all-powerful wizard is found to be a small, frail man with nothing but clever machines, so all the allure of the world is nothing more than filth doomed to destruction. Our lives today are filled with concerns. We want to know how to feed our families how to travel freely and securely, how to best educate our children, how we can enjoy this life, how we can live longer or spend time with our loved ones as long as we can. The world offers solutions to each of these questions. Just turn on the television, watch YouTube, flip through, uh, scroll through Facebook or TikTok, look at billboards scattered across the highway if you're not on social media. Look at the neon lights and you'll see answers to every one of these problems. Feed your family at this restaurant. Find enjoyment by purchasing this boat or this RV or getting another case of beer or liquor or by stopping at this club or abandoning your spouse if you don't feel like there's love in it anymore. Educate your children in the finest schools. Have making money be, the mo be your goal in life and then you'll have true freedom. Some of these solutions are not inherently bad in themselves. Many are alluring. But from the world's perspective, these are not merely tools for a good life. They are the definition of a good life. You only have a good life when these boxes are ticked. When good things become ultimate things, even that good thing becomes an idol even your own family, even religious activity, if you're not careful, can become an idol in your life. 
The call to the Christian is to be faithful to the end. Turning from the allure of spiritual adultery, the call of the unbeliever is to run from the false promises of the world and into the loving arms of the Lamb, who is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and who is guaranteed the ultimate victory over Babylon and her allies. This text gives us three reasons this morning why we should reject the worldliness that is offered and embodied in Babylon. First this morning, worldliness, reason number one why we should reject worldliness is because worldliness is grotesque. Look at these first couple verses. Let's read verses one through six together. It says, Then one of the seven angels who had seven bowls came and said to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great prostitute who is seated on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed sexual immorality, and with the wine of whose sexual immorality the dwellers on earth have become drunk. And he carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was full of blasphemous names. And it had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and jewels and pearls, holding in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the impurities of her sexual immorality. And on her forehead was written a name, a, a name of mystery, Babylon the Great, mother of prostitutes and of earth's abominations. I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. Let's pause there for a second. This is not a pretty picture. See, chapters 17 through 19 really kind of get a, get a zooming in look at the sixth and seventh bold judgments that are brought in in chapter 16. 17 through 22, these chapters form a contrast of two cities. It's really similar to Proverbs that, that com compares and contrasts two women. There's, the, there's Lady Wisdom and Lady Folly in Proverbs, who we are, we are asked to follow Lady Wisdom and reject Lady Folly. And here in chapter 17 through 22, Lady Folly is Babylon. And Lady Wisdom, like in Proverbs, is the kingdom of God, the new Jerusalem. Citizenship in the, in, in the New Jerusalem, like following Lady Wisdom, is found in a relationship with Jesus Christ. We see here as this angel grabs John and says, hey, I want to show you some more details. One of the angels who had poured out one of the bowls of the wrath of God says, John, I want to show you something. Look at what says he, he says, I want to show you the judgment of the great prostitute. There is no question about what is going to happen with this, with this woman. There is no question what will happen to this city. He doesn't say, let's, let's find out what's going to happen in the rest of the story. We'll see how it turns out in the end. He says, let me show you how she's going to be judged. There's no question in the book of Revelation what happens when you're the enemies of God. There's judgment. We are already told that it is over for her before we have even begun. Her demise is certain. Lady Folly, Babylon, her demise is certain. It describes her as a great prostitute who is seated on many waters. This is imagery that is borrowed from Jeremiah chapter 51 and verse 13, where Babylon, the ancient city, is described as, Oh, you who dwell by many waters. John is borrowing that same language, describing this metaphorical Babylon in the same way that the ancient city of Babylon was described. She is also seated on these waters. Now, verse 15, if we look forward in chapter 17, tells us what these waters are. The waters that you saw in verse 15, where the prostitute is seated, are peoples and multitudes and nations and languages. She is seated on them. It is people from all over the world that have given their allegiance to the beast, to the Antichrist, to the dragon, and have also given their allegiance to Babylon. And here she is seated on them. This indicates her control over them. She has them under her thumb, so to speak. Now before we think well, this is a cruel dictator, yes, she's a cruel dictator, but her subjects are there voluntarily. Look at how the rest of the verse, how verse 2 describes this. 
She's seated on many waters with whom the kings of the earth have committed sexual immorality and with, the, and with the wine of whose sexual immorality the dwellers of the earth have become drunk. The people who are her subservients, who are her followers, are there on purpose. They're not there by accident. They have chosen to put and throw in their lot with Babylon. They have chosen to commit sexual immorality with her. They have tro- chosen to drink the cup of her abomination. These earth dwellers, as Revelation refers to them, are those who have rejected Christ and have thrown in their lot with Babylon. The dragon, the, with Babylon, the dragon, the antichrist, and the false prophet. Earlier in the book, these are the people who in God called for repentance and ca- put out his judgment. They ran and hid from him. They hid from the one true God as he warned them to repent. And instead of repenting, they ran into the arms of slavery. So we don't want that God guy. He wants us to repent and to follow him. We don't want that. This person's promising us all kinds of stuff. Let's go with them. She offered everything to them. Everlasting pleasure, wealth, fame, fortune, happiness, all in exchange for their worship. Not just their loyalty, but their worship. And worship they did. Now, of course she's alluring. Just look, look at her description here. First, the angel takes John away into the wilderness. It's fascinating that in, in, in much of scripture, and especially in the book of Revelation, the city is a place of destruction. The city is a place of, of persecution. It's a place of sin, of, of immorality. And so John takes, or uh, the angel takes John to the wilderness. Earlier in the book, when the dragon was chasing, uh, chasing the offspring of the woman, that, was the, that is the church, he's trying to bring persecution on God's people. God takes the, the, the seed of the woman, God takes this child into the wilderness to keep her safe. All right, to keep this child safe, he brings, he brings his people into the wilderness to keep them safe from the dragon. And so now the angel brings John into the wilderness, this place of safety, not just so he can be safe from, the, from, the, from Babylon, but also so he can get a clearer picture as he looks out. He's now far away from her reach, and you can get a clear picture of exactly what's going on. It's the top-down view, if you will. He's able to see her from God's perspective. At first, she seems alluring. She is seated on a scarlet beast, matching her own scarlet garments. This beast seems off, though. He's full of blasphemous names and has seven horns and seven heads and ten horns. Surely she is seen now uh, to be teamed up with the beast, though, that arose from the earth in chapter 13. She is allied with the friends of the dragon. So close are they that she is allowed to ride the beast. Power seems to be in her control Wealth seems to overflow from her as she is found draped in purple and scarlet, adorned with gold and jewels and pearls. She has a golden cup. I mean, who doesn't want to hang out with the person with the gold cup? This golden cup must have been filled with something just as wonderful as the cup which holds it. And the earth are lined up around the block to get a drink. Only what's in her cup, John sees. From his view, he sees what's in the cup is nothing but abominations and impurities. Not at all appetizing. And certainly not fulfilling. Like a prostitute for the most wealthy, she wears a headband with her name on it. Mystery, Babylon the Great, mother of prostitutes and of the earth's abomination. In her name being recorded as mystery, we almost certainly should read that she is not a literal Babylon. There is not a literal kingdom or country that is being talked about here. Rather, she is a representation of the evil of evil nations that are against the Lord. She is like Babylon in that she is wealthy and arrogant in her rebellion against God. She offers life to all who follow her, but all she can really promise is death. In fact, 
the death which she brings is made even more hauntingly evident by the tonic by which she has stupefied herself. In verse 6, we find that she is drunk. This beautifully adorned woman is nothing but a drunkard. And what is she drunk on? Verse 6 says she is drunk on the blood of the saints, the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. Where does she get her kicks? How does she get her best? She gets her best by drinking the blood of those who follow Jesus. As they are killed, she rejoices. And she is stupefied by her drunk. So much for alluring. In reality, when seen clearly, when the curtain is pulled back, we see not a beautiful woman, but a drunken hag, drunk on the blood of those she has killed. She finds great joy in the destruction of God's people. And the wares she offers work toward that end. She is the anti-bride, if you will. The new Jerusalem, the true home of the bride, is described in Revelation 20 as, as, as a place that, 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 that is, has gold and precious jewels and pearls. The bride herself in chapter 19 is described as not clothed in scarlet, as the prostitute is here. She is clothed in fine linen, pure and bright and white. Like Maleficent of the movie Sleeping Beauty, the mirror may have told Babylon that she was beautiful on the outside, but she was far from beautiful on the inside. The woman Babylon is the world system that stands against Christ. She urges believers to give up their allegiance to Christ and instead put in their lot with her. End your persecutions and enjoy luxury. Culture, pleasure, just simply leave the whole Jesus nonsense behind is her call. In the first century, churches were not only persecuted by the sword, but they were also enticed by the allurements of the great city of Rome and all she had to offer. Today, nothing has changed. The cup which the world still offers to the believer is a cup filled with world order that is meant to turn our eyes away from the Lord Jesus Christ. A cup that is full of pornography, absorption in sports or video games, luxuries, worldly fame and power, and a variety of lusts. Church, with all those things, while all those things have their appeal, they may look great on the outside, the inside is grotesque. They're like the Pharisees, whitewashed tombs full of dead man's bones. In reality, when the curtain is pulled back, worldliness is hideous. Christian, run and run fast into the arms of Jesus. And secondly, this morning, not only is worldliness hideous, worldliness is foolish. Worldliness is foolish. Look how the, this, this passage continues to unfold in the second half of verse 6. John says, when I saw her, I marveled greatly. This 90-year-old man had likely seen a lot in his life, but this shook him to his very core. Verse 7, but the angel said to me, why do you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast with the seven heads and the ten horns that carries her. So the angel says, I'm going to help you explain, I'm going to help explain all this to you. Now on a first reading, this earlier in the week when I first walked through this passage, I said, angel, that doesn't help much. <sighs> well, let's read what he, what he says. It doesn't seem to help on the face of it, but we'll walk through it and we'll understand better. The beast that you saw was and is not, and is about to rise from the bottomless pit and go to destruction. And the dwellers on earth whose names have not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world will marvel to see the beast because it was and is not and is to come. This calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman is seated. They are also seven kings, five of whom have fallen. One is, the other has not yet come. And when he does come, excuse me, five of them have fallen, one is, and the other is not yet come. When he does come, he must remain only a little while. As for the beast that was and is not, it is, an, it is an eighth, but it belongs to the seven, and it goes to destruction. 
And the ten horns that you saw are ten kings who have not yet received royal power, but they are to receive authority as kings for one hour together with the beast. They are of one mind, and they hand over their power and authority to the beast. They will make war on the lamb, and the lamb will conquer them, for he is Lord of lords and king of kings, and, tho- and those with him are called and chosen and faithful. Now, how many of you reading that say, I, got ex- I know exactly what he's talking about now. That makes all the sense in the world. Now I get it. I didn't either. <laughs> Let's walk through this. We'll do the best we can to understand what this angel is trying to explain. The angel, in fact, continues his explanation in verses 15 through 18. We'll pick that up here in a minute. He begins to describe this woman by describing the beast that she is riding. Now, this beast is none other than the Antichrist that was introduced all the way back in chapter 13. He's a false mockery of Christ. He's described here by the angel as one who was and is not and is about to rise from the bottomless pit and go to destruction. We see earlier in the book that God is described as the one who was, who is, and is to come. We see Jesus described as the one who who was killed and was raised back to life. This antichrist we remember from chapter 13 had something similar. He had a mortal wound on his head. He was killed by this wound on his head, but he came back to life. He mocked the resurrection. In this description as the one who was and is not and is about to rise to destruction, it mocks the living God. He He is a parody of God, a false mockery of Christ. He appears to be a savior, but he's a false savior. He's a pathetic replacement of the lamb. His resurrection is not victorious, for he will quickly go right to his destruction. The earth dwellers are then described in the second half of verse 8. The dwellers on earth whose names have not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world will marvel to see the beast, because it was and is not and is to come. The earth dwellers are defined as those who are not believers, those who have not trusted Christ as their Savior, those who have not recognized their sinfulness and their need for a Savior and have turned to Jesus. At this point for these earth dwellers, it is too late for repentance. They have given themselves completely to the unholy trinity. They will be awed by the pseudo-lamb and its imitations and false promises of salvation. It's also described that seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. We see earlier she's seated on many waters, and we see that this, this beast on which she sits are not just heads of this beast, but, it all, but it represent mountains. Now, she is now undeniably, Babylon is now undeniably associated with Rome. Though this does not necessitate Rome literally. This is not a prophecy in Scripture that the ancient city of Rome will rise up from the ashes and there'll be a literal city there. Rather, this is a depiction of something who is like Rome. Babylon is a Rome-like city, a Rome-like world order. By the end of the first century, Rome had been known for centuries as the city of seven hills. It was inscribed on coins that were circulated during John's life. The city itself was literally located on seven hills. It was a massive city to behold. And this is how this woman is described. But the beast and the harlot who rides her is not merely one kingdom. For the seven heads, the scripture tells us, are also seven kings. Five have fallen, one who is and one who has not yet come. The beast itself is also an eighth king that belongs to the seven. Now this section, this, if you're a mathematician, this probably would drive you nuts. How can an eighth be a seventh? What, the, what does this even mean? What are you talking about, right? John is not here doing math. He's not trying to count historical records. Rather, he's trying to describe things in this poetic storytelling form. This section, in fact, more than any other passage, is one of the most difficult passages in chapter 17 to understand. Many interpreters have tried to give a one-to-one correlation of each of these seven kings by assigning them to past Roman emperors or past Rome-like kingdoms like Babylon, the kingdom of the Medo-Persians, the Assyrians, along with 
Robert Mounts and Dennis Johnson, I would, I would suggest that the most satisfactory explanation of these seven kings is that the, is that the number is symbolic. John has done this throughout the book. He has used the number seven to describe a completion. John is not trying to tabulate the past, but he's declaring the nearness of the end. The time of these kings is over. The beast's reign, the anti-God, the beast's reign, excuse me, the anti-God world order holds sway over the whole history of fallen humanity. And most importantly to the text, its time is short. The beast's time is coming to an end. He is going swiftly to destruction. It tells us about the seventh king. He has not, not yet come, but he will remain only for a little while. It's ha- ending soon. The reign of, ta- of the terror of the beast is almost at an end. The beast here is described as an eighth king that belongs to the seventh. Belongs to the seven, excuse me. This is likely speaking of the Antichrist himself, evil power incarnate, the one whom the other seven were but a forerunner. And where is his fate? Where is the, what is the fate of evil incarnate? Will he be victorious where the others have failed? No, verse 11 says, and he goes to destruction. Verse 12 and 13 then describe these ten horns. Ten horns, like previously, represent power. Although these horns have no royal power, when they do get power, the text says, they immediately give that power up to the beast. Their power is very temporary indeed. Most likely, these allude to the nations of the earth, all of the nations of the earth that will be made subservient to the Antichrist in the last days. They rule with the Antichrist, but that rule does not last long. As they team up with the Antichrist, though, they share with him a common hostility toward the opposing kingdom, the kingdom of Christ and his followers. By now, we know that their opposition is foolish. They've thrown their lot in with the wrong team. Their desire is to conquer the Lamb, who several times already in the book of Revelation, we have seen that he is, that the Lamb has been declared to be the conqueror. He will win. And now we see the board is set, the pieces are moving, but the outcome is already determined. Jesus will win. As we've said before, if you could put a headline over the book of Revelation, it's not that scary times are coming, it's that Jesus wins. Why will Jesus win? The text tells us it's because he is Lord of lords, and he is king of kings, and those with with him are called and chosen and faithful. The Antichrist is merely a parody, but Jesus is the real thing. As the Son of God, he has all power and all authority. The Antichrist has derived power. You see, these kings give their power to him. His power is only derived and given to him. But earthly power will never be enough to conquer King Jesus. The believers here that are with Jesus are described as called and chosen and faithful. Called. God's people are not random. They are those who the triune God has specifically called out to be his. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ today, you are not an accident. You are called. But not only are you called, you are also chosen. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you can never say that no one wanted you. You can never say that you were a failure, that your life was meaningless. No, God wanted you and he chose you before the foundation of the world. You were called and chosen and also these people are described as faithful. Over and over in Revelation, Our responsibility to be faithful is cited. Herein lies the human responsibility aspect of our salvation. God has done all the saving. We are called to be faithful, and true believers will be found faithful. At the end of chapter at the end of chapter 19, the final battle, at the end of chapter 19, the final battle is described. The fuller description of what briefly is told us here in these verses. We will come with Jesus. 
not as soldiers to fight in the battle, but as spectators of our conquering king. We get to come with him and watch him as he conquers finally over all of evil. Following the world is not only grotesque, but it's foolish. The alluring spectacle of Vanity Fair has pitched their armies against the unbeatable foe. There is no hope for victory. Those who reject Christ find in Jesus something so repulsive that they would plunge themselves to their death in in league with with a phony rather than submit to the loving rule of the Lord Jesus Christ. Christian, if your eyes are turned to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, you have not chosen wisdom but you have chosen folly. Beware, for that decision will be to your detriment. One day you will stand before your holy God, and what account will you give? I urge you, turn from the worldly foolishness and run to the true safety and security of King Jesus. And third this morning, worldliness is self-destructive. Worldliness is grotesque. We should avoid worldliness because worldliness is grotesque. Second, worldliness is foolish. There is no winning in following the world. But third, worldliness is self-destructive. Look at verse 15. And the angel said to me, The waters that you saw where the prostitute is seated are peoples and multitudes and nations and languages. And the ten horns that you saw, they and the beast will hate the prostitute. They will make her desolate and naked and devour her flesh and burn her up with fire. For God has put it into their hearts to carry out his purpose by being of one mind and handing over their royal power to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. And the woman that you saw is the great city that has dominion over the kings of the earth. The worldliness is self-destructive. We see in the beginning of this paragraph that the waters are defined, the waters that she sat on are defined as all the earth dwellers encompassing the entire world, every tribe and people and language. She sits on top of them and exerts control over them. In verse 16 we see but the ten, that the ten horns, these kingdomless kings, and the beast which he rides will hate the prostitute, the Babylon that had offered them all the allurements. They will come to hate her, and they will rise up against her, making her desolate and naked, and they will devour her flesh and burn her with fire. Verse 17 is important. They do this because God put it in their hearts to carry out his purpose by being of one mind and handing over their royal power to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. Why do they do this? Because God said so. Because God had determined before the foundation of the world that this is how he would bring them to their end. Here again we see two important truths. God can and will use even evil to destroy evil. They are all his creation and all under his control. Not even evil is outside of God's sovereign control. They have no autonomy. God is fully in control of even all the most, uh, of the most egregious wickedness. And he will use it one day to his honor and his glory in bringing about its own self-destruction. And two, because God is sovereign, he will have the last word. His promises are certain. His word is true, and only he has any real authority in this world. We sometimes will fret and think, as we look around the world, as we th- look at powerful people, we say, what are they going to do to us? How, are we going to be safe? Is it going to be okay? Be reminded, no one has authority except God gives it to them. And even those people are under his authority. God is in full control. Finally, we're reminded who this woman is in the last verse in verse 18. The woman you saw is the great city that has dominion over the kings of the earth. She is the one who has dominion over all. But even with all her power, 
she could not save herself. She was functioning as having control over these people, but ultimately what happens, the people rise up and destroy her. The very evil over which she had dominion turned on her and destroyed her. You see, worldliness is self-destructive. All that is offered by the world is coming to, will and is coming to an end. The job title that you long for will one day mean nothing. The wealth that you chase will one day mean nothing and will all vanish. The pleasures that you seek will one day be judged and in that day it will be utterly meaningless. Sin will destroy you. Sin does not have the ability to build up. It does not have the ability to fulfill you, to make you a better person. Sin, at the end of the day, all it will do, all it can do, is destroy. Worldliness will destroy you. Idolatry and sin may give pleasure or happiness for a moment, but ultimately it will destroy you. But in Christ, sin is conquered once and for all at the cross. Will you give it up? Will you choose to be a Babylonian? Or will you choose to be a follower of Jesus? Why should we choose Jesus over worldliness? Because worldliness ultimately is grotesque. Worldliness is ultimately foolish. And worldliness is ultimately self destructive. You might be familiar with the song by Fernando Ortega, Give Me Jesus, Give Me Jesus. You can have all this world, but give me Jesus. Fanny Crosby, the famous hymn writer before him, wrote this, Take the world, but give me Jesus. All its joys are but a name, but his love abides forever through eternal years the same. Take the world, but give me Jesus, sweetest comfort of my soul. With the Savior watching o'er me, I can sing, though thunders roll. Take the world, but give me Jesus, in his cross my trust shall be, till with clearer, brighter vision, face to face, my Lord, I see. Oh, the height and depth of mercy, oh, the length and breadth of love, all the fullness of redemption, pledge of endless life above. That's what Jesus promises. Will you take the world or will you take Jesus? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this chapter that gives us one last plea before the destruction of Babylon. To cast aside the world and to choose Jesus. Lord, the world looks so alluring. The pleasures and happiness that this world promises, Lord, can look so wonderful. And it promises if we just give our lives to it, that all our problems will go away. Lord, as we see in your word, it only multiplies the problems. It's grotesque and it's foolish and it's self-destructive. Lord, I was careful not to be too specific today because you know our hearts. You know the sins that we carry. Lord, we, none of us in this room are perfect. Even us believers, we still sin. We still rebel against you. So Lord, you know our hearts. Holy Spirit, you know where the issues are, where our greatest temptations are, where our idols are. Lord, I promise this, I pray this morning that you would help us to crush those idols, to destroy those idols and turn to you. Lord, if there's someone here who does not know you as Savior, that, Lord, right now, our world is defined by the pleasures of the world. Lord, it's not too late. One day it will be, but, Lord, it is not too late now to abandon the world, to abandon Babylon, and to join with King Jesus. Lord, the destruction of this world, the destruction of this world system that is against you is promised and is guaranteed. 
And Lord, you still, in your mercy and your grace, you offer us salvation. I pray this morning, Lord, if there's someone who does not know you as Savior, they would not leave this room today, they would not leave this building today without knowing for sure that they have a relationship with you, without repenting of sin, believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, and receiving salvation. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would do what you will. Pray this in your name. Amen. If you'd like to stand, the altar is open. you before we have our tithes and offerings that if you are interested in uh, helping get a corporate prayer ministry off the ground, uh, if you'd be interested in helping helping with that, helping us figure out exactly how to do that, uh, make sure you stick around after the service. Um, and uh, right, right now we have our time of tithes and offerings. It's an opportunity to worship the Lord through our giving. Um, and uh, if we can have the guys get us ready for that, I can help you. Okay, thank you. Um, let's pray for the, for the Lord to bless this time. Lord, I pray for this opportunity to worship you through our, through our finances. Lord, that you would be honored and glorified. Lord, that, this, that the money that's brought in today, Lord, would not be used for our own aggrandizement, Lord, but it would be used for your kingdom. May you bless it. May you honor it. And Lord, may it be used for your glory. Praise in your name. Amen.
have a wonderful week.